your data and maybe have models that can create rich outputs, some of the first things that people do traditionally is fit autoencoders, and I argued that density estimation was another natural unsupervised learning task and that it was a useful task in its own right for data analysis. So what we're going to do today is dig into that a bit more and see, well, how do we actually do that if we want to use the advances from machine learning to do density estimation as well as we possibly can and using the computing resources we actually have, how are we going to do it? So if you don't have a specific need for a probability density, you might follow some other unsupervised learning principle. So you saw a lot about GANs, and there are many other uh, approaches to unsupervised learning that you saw last week. But for this talk, I'm going to assume that for some reason we do want a function p of x, that for a large feature vector x can tell you one number, the probability of seeing that vector. So if you see a load of images, represented as x, you have a model that can not just generate new images like GANs can, but can also attach these numbers to them which puts them on the same comparison scale as many other probabilistic methods. And that's sometimes useful and it's sometimes not necessary. But I think a lot of the tricks that I'm going to mention for all of the methods through this talk are useful in general. So even if you are sitting there thinking, I don't care about P of X, and that would be fine. There are very respected people in the field of machine learning who think that they will never need to evaluate the probability of a, of a vector. Um, I hope there's some useful tricks in here. So there are three strands of methods that I'm going to talk about in this talk. And the first one, autoregressive models, I talked a bit about last time. So this is the idea of just predicting things one at a time, like if you were predicting text, seeing it one character at a time, which was a classic game that Shannon introduced as an idea of trying to understand the information content of language. And then there are these other approaches that I'll get onto later called unnormalized models or energy-based models and normalizing flows or just flows. So that's jargon that we're using and hopefully that some of the jargon will be demystified by the end. So there are other approaches to building probabilistic models and these three st strands I've chosen are the ones where you get a fairly simple function. You see your image patch, stuff that looks like fairly neural net stuff will happen, and you will get a number giving the probability of the image patch. Um, I have omitted things like variational autoencoders or other probabilistic models. You also heard about topic modeling last week. Those are great models. Sometimes you've got strong motivation to use them, and you really want the latent variables from those models. but they're technically more demanding and they're out of scope for this talk. So we're going to try and do the easiest thing first and, and see how far we can get with it. So um, dive back into the autoregressive models. As a reminder, this was the setup. We reduced the problem of density estimation to a guessing game where we guess one of our features at a time. So we've got this long vector of features that we don't know, and you could see these pictures as either a sampling process or as a process that assigns numbers to your vectors. So um, you predict the first element in your vector, then you get to look at the first element, you predict the second element, you predict the third, just as we predicted characters one at a time. But instead of characters, it could be real numbers like pixel values. Um, it can be binary variables, it could be variables of any type. And if we can solve all of those prediction problems, we just multiply together the probability of all our guesses and we get a joint probability. Now, this view is super powerful because if you know how to do probabilistic prediction, then if we had infinite compute, um, I could just leave the room now because you already know a lot about machine learning and you could do this thing. So if our feature vector here was binary, each of these probabilities you could get using a binary classifier. You could use logistic regression. You could say, I need to predict a binary outcome given a bunch of previous things. That's a binary classification problem. Logistic regression will give me this probability. And if this is a real valued quantity, then you're going to need to have a neural network that can give a guess of a real valued quantity and will actually predict a whole distribution 
not just the probability of some outcome occurring. But if you know how to make a probabilistic guess of an individual outcome, you can then just chain together those guesses and get the probability. And this product rule here is sometimes called the chain rule because it's chaining together these guesses. And once you've got that, you can also sample using the same method. So if we've got these uh, individual models, I can just, instead of um, looking at a test example, I've got a guess of what this first element is going to be. I can just draw a sample from that guess. I can put my sample into the first element, get a distribution over what will happen next, and draw a sample from that distribution. So people call that ancestral sampling if they sample through a model. Um, so with one sweep through all of these models, we can also generate imagined image patches or imagined vectors of galaxies or things like that. And the problem I left you with at the end of the last talk was that this simple-minded approach of just putting a for loop around all our features and predicting them or sampling them one at a time is pretty freaking expensive. And we are going to want to do something about that cost if we're wanting to deal with the same sorts of data that the rest of machine learning routinely deals with, because we routine, routinely have problems with thousands of features. And you know, if you're doing something like spam classification, you might have millions of potential features, because the presence or absence of any word that anyone ever has written could be a feature. So we're going to have to think, mm, a standard neural network sort of co costs order dh if you've got h hidden units and d features. If we do d of those, we'll have this big cost, which is a factor d times more expensive. We don't want to run these d separate neural networks. We'd like to have something that looks sort of like one neural network or has the cost of one neural network that does everything at the same time because that's the cost of autoencoders. So if we're much worse than autoencoders to get probabilities, people are going to go, yeah, this probability stuff is too much hassle, and they're going to stick with the autoencoding. So here is the first attempt that we had at making this, this stuff scale, and it was a sort of simple idea for how can we get A neural network with one, it's a bit of a weird, um, and then parameters are for the so, um, um, and I've seen the first pixel, then I'll probably predict that the second pixel is a very similar grayscale value. So these parameters might describe a tightly peaked distribution close to this pixel value with some width to say how much do the pixels move in intensity. Once I predict the second pixel, I get to look at it. So now I've got a neural network with two inputs, and 
I then repeat the same game. So I do neural network stuff to give me the parameters of the distribution I'm going to use to predict the third pixel. Now, the thing we want to do is share the computing power that we're, we're doing to make these different predictions. We're now making the third prediction in a, in a row, and we want these predictions not to be super expensive. So when I create this hidden layer activation here with these two inputs, I don't just start from scratch and run the normal neural net code, which would multiply this vector of length 2 by a 2 by h matrix to produce all the activations because I've already computed all the activations for this first hidden unit. So I can just add on to the activation of these hidden units what I need to add on for this new input. And when I make the next prediction, I can keep a running total. So I'm going to just add on to the hidden activations of this layer values that the third input want to push it around by, having cached the activation contribution from the previous elements. So at each stage, I make a prediction when I get to see a new pixel in my image, or I get to see a new galaxy feature in my galaxy prediction problem. Um, all I do is add on h different values to my hidden layer, given the running total that I've already accumulated so far. So every prediction problem involves h computations. I have to update each of the h hidden units, and each of those updates is super simple. And as I sweep through adding in each of my inputs, I do that d times. So overall, the cost is order dh. So it's like I'm just activating this hidden layer using this bank of inputs, which is normally an order dh matrix multiply. But I don't do that matrix multiply all at once. I do it one column at a time and look at the numbers as I go. So I have to do a little bit of extra work to sort of look at intermediate results as I accumulate the hidden activation. Um, but I don't have a bigger computational complexity than a standard neural network. I've got a worse constant. It is slower. Um, and it's less cache friendly as well. So on GPUs, it is actually quite a lot slower. But it's only a constant factor. So it's not out of the question to do this thing. So. This simple idea, um, Hugo La Rochelle and I called NAID for Neural Autoregressive Distribution Estimation or Density Estimation. And we first did it with binary values. So we were predicting binary feature vectors. And binary vectors are very common in machine learning. So uh, it often, if you don't know how to deal with your features, it's good to just create binary versions of them. It's easier to fit those models. And um, so each of these outputs, in that case, was just a single number. And it looked like we were sort of doing a logistic regression prediction of each uh, of the bits. But um, it was rather than logistic regression using the previous features, it was using this intermediate hidden layer. So we had this nonlinear model. And surprisingly, in the statistics literature, there aren't actually very strong tractable models of binary vectors. So you can do things like fit mixture models, mixtures of multivariate Bernoullis, or you can fit Chowley trees or various other models. But it's hard to write down a good, flexible, multivariate distribution over a very long vector of binary values. And you don't want to tabulate these distributions because uh, the brute force general discrete distribution grows exponentially quickly. So at the time we published this work, this simple approach was basically the state of the art um, way of generically estimating binary vectors. If you got many different data sets from different fields and said, I just want to fit these binary vectors and imagine what my future vectors might look like, the simple minded approach worked well. And then if we wanted to deal with real valued features to model things like image patches, we'd have to do a bit more work and replace these parameters with parameters of distributions, which is complicated. So I said last time that the standard um, neural net approach for predicting real values is called a mixture density network. So the output layer of this RNA thing looks like a whole bunch of parameters of a mixture of Gaussians at every stage. So modeling real valued data, in this context at least, was a lot more complicated than modeling binary data. So we started with the easy problem and did binary data. And also, we were finding that most of the parameters were up here in the final output layer of the neural network to sort of model real-valued patches. Um, so 
it wasn't such an enormous win compared to the binary data because things like mixtures of Gaussians are actually quite good generic models of real valued features. So the real valued version of this, Arnade, didn't actually get better results on modeling image patches. So we, we weren't immediately going to get better deblurring and denoising models by going for this approach. But that's partly because people have thought a lot about how to set up models for image patches. And we were able to get better results across a variety of other data sets. It was a good way of having correlated um, problems. So we were able to still write a paper where we honestly said, look, it doesn't work very well for image patches. But this simple-minded autoregressive approach does work very well for a whole bunch of the data sets you can download from the UCI machine learning repository that come from different fields. And what we're really hoping is that this sort of technology would be something that you could embed in other machine learning methods or in other models. It's a general tool. So sort of as a proof of concept of that, um, Benigno Uria, who was my first PhD student, um, wrote with this list of authors a paper where we took an, an existing speech synthesis system, identified where it was doing some density estimation with Gaussians, and just plunked this thing in. Um, it then immediately got better results, but is not super compelling for a variety of reasons. So one is it's quite expensive. The, the big O complexity of the thing is quite good, but in practice, the constants aren't great, and it's pretty slow, especially due to these very large mixtures of Gaussians. And the other thing um, that was disappointing was that this was a model of speech. And I was really hoping that we would be able to draw samples from this model of speech to generate new utterances. I mean, that's what you want, right, from a model of speech. If it's synthesizing speech, you sample from it. But in practice, at this time, if you sampled from a probabilistic model of speech, it was really, really noisy. It sounded like junk. And so there are hacks in there where you try and output speech which is more probable than a typical sample from the distribution. Um, which was a hack, and it ma makes the speech sound sort of too regular and a bit robotic and alien. So at this point, I was like, we really need better models of real value data. We want to be able to plonk in sort of decent models into speech synthesis systems and actually generate from them for real and get things that sound like speech. Um, that was the goal back then, and you know, and now that has actually been done. I was amazed by this wave network from DeepMind where by using larger models, they're actually able to generate for real from the, de uh, from the model without hacks things that sound like speech. So what we want to know is what are the sorts of tricks we need to know to get between the sort of simple one layer approach with brute force mixtures of Gaussians to models that actually work for real on large data and sort of generate these things. So there's been a lot of contributions from across the field. I mean, WaveNet partly worked by brute force was a massive model, and they threw a lot of compute at it. Um, and it was insanely slow to generate from in the first version. But uh, amazingly, this stuff is becoming practical now. So by the end of this session, what we're wanting to do is understand how does that work? What are, what are the things we need to know to get there? OK, so one way of putting that slightly facetiously would be, how can we make this stuff more expensive? So I've got this simple one layer thing and it doesn't capture everything we need to know. So roughly speaking, what I want to do is throw a load more parameters at it, and a load more data perhaps, and absorb that data into the parameters. So how can I do a bigger version of these models that will absorb the data and will do well? So one idea is to use recurrent neural networks. Um, here I'm making predictions one pixel at a time, or one part of this speech signal at a time. And I've got this very simple way of bringing in a new data point where the change in the internal representation is linear. And that linear change helped me save computation. But if I didn't try and save computation, I could just use LSTMs. I could use any model I like to make the next prediction. And I'd be back to sort of where I started, where I'm like, if I'm going to be predicting many, many pixels or many, many frames of audio, this is going to be too expensive. So. It's one idea, but I'm just going to put that to the side for the moment. Um, back when I started 
<coughs> sorry, back when I started this work, you know, a deep neural network for us was like three layers or something. And the idea of insisting on having a layer of neural network for every pixel in our image or every frame of audio just seemed out of the question. So these ultra deep networks, recurrent networks, didn't seem to be practical. So what we're going to look at first is like, what happens if I just do a deeper version of what I've already shown you? Like, let's have a two layer neural network instead of a thousand layer neural network. So um, here's the same picture, and we can reason through how expensive it would be. Um, I've got a, a shared neural network I'm going to use for all my prediction tasks. Um, and I'm just going to add on to the input as I go. So I have to make my first prediction from nothing. I just have to say, what's the first feature normally like? And then after looking at it, I put in the first pixel of my image. Neural net stuff happens, now a deep neural network that gives me parameters that I use to make the next prediction. Now. This neural network costs order h squared because there's this big matrix multiply in here between the two hidden layers. So this one prediction costs order h squared. And in theory, this is the most expensive bit. For large mixtures of Gaussians, the expensive bit might be up here. But for large neural networks, we normally think about that cost. And then after I predict the second pixel, or I predict the second frame of audio, I put it in at the bottom. And I can add on to this hidden layer like I did before. So I can just incrementally update this. But then there's a nonlinearity, which means that everything that happens after that is going to be different to the previous time. So this h squared matrix multiply between the hidden layers, I'm just going to have to do that again. I'm not going to be able to reuse anything from the previous step. Um, and so we can see that the cost of this is going to be order dh squared, because every prediction I make is going to have this cost that I'm, I don't see a clever trick to share that costs order h squared, and I'm going to have these d prediction problems. And we just did not have the compute power to even like run that. It, it will be interesting to see how, how that would work just to get the number to see what to beat. And you know, if we'd been in DeepMind, we'd have probably just done it. Um, but we weren't. We're in a university, so we didn't even do it. And we're like, how can we uh, make any progress here? So one thing to think about is like autoencoders don't have this problem. We're wanting to do something quite similar to autoencoding, sort of a model that can spit out the things that we're seeing. And we want to have a similar sort of structure to be able to just have arbitrary hidden layers and choose them. But autoencoders are somehow a lot cheaper. So you put in an image. You do one feed forward pass of a standard neural net. It looks much like any other neural net, like a classifier. It just has this output that is shared that predicts all of the pixels. And that one pass through the neural net is order dh, or maybe order dh plus h squared. But it's what we're used to doing. And, and the only downside of autoencoders is that they don't provide a real probabilistic model. They're just this sort of heuristic that you do. And it's not clear how to compare them to other probabilistic models either. So you get a reconstruction cost from an autoencoder, but there's a worry that a cheating autoencoder that just copies the pixels through its network gets a reconstruction error of zero and does nothing useful. So forcing it to be a probabilistic model is one way of getting it to be comparable to other methods. And it's not the only way, but it's something that we wanted to do. So what I'm going to sh uh, share with you are two different tricks of tweaking an autoencoder so that you can look at it and say, oh, this will now give us valid probabilities. And we're going to do that without introducing complicated latent variables where we have to do inference and variational stuff. We're just going to do standard neural network stuff, just slightly differently. So um, Hugo LaRochelle and I actually came up with these two tricks at the same time, but then it took a lot longer to get one of them published than the other. So it looks like they came one after the other. But this was the one we published first. So. Here, we change how we think about training. My thought process was, we're going to throw this vector into the neural net, and we're going to do some very expensive computation in the middle. And we want to get as much out of that expensive computation as possible. I want to sort of learn a lot of stuff from doing that, rather than maybe just learning about one of the pixels. So what we're going to do is pick a random subset of the inputs here. I've picked pixel number two, three, and five and zero out or remove pixels one and four. Then we're going to 
do standard neural net stuff. In principle, you could have convolutional layers, attention mechanisms, whatever you want in the middle. But we were just doing standard dense neural networks because we had generic data that we, didn't, we weren't really thinking of as a sequence. And then like an autoencoder, we're going to predict the pixels in the input image. But we're only going to predict the ones that we didn't see. So we're going to output parameters that we're going to use to predict the first pixel. We're going to output parameters to predict the fourth one. And actually, in our implementation, we would output the parameters for all of them because it's just easier to vectorize these things and do everything and then mask out the bits you don't need. So this is much like a denoising autoencoder. We've randomly removed some of the inputs. But unlike a denoising autoencoder, the cost function only looks at the probabilities of predicting the things that you didn't see. So there's no way of cheating in this model, or there's no e even way of sort of doing quite well by just copying. You have to learn how to fill in things you haven't seen from the other things, and that's the only thing you're rewarded for. So in hindsight, it sort of seems kind of obvious. I'm not sure why the original denoising autoencoder paper didn't have that cost function. But it was what we did. But the reason we've done this is because really we're thinking about autoregressive models. We want to be able to predict um, an image one pixel at a time. And if we've trained this completion machine uh, after, afterwards at test time, we can choose what inputs to put in. So we could say, I'm going to only put in the first pixel um, and predict the second one. And then I could say, I'm going to put in the first two pixels, predict the third one. So this is actually the same model as the expensive one I showed you. I just trained it differently. But at test time, I can use it as an autoregressive model. I can actually do more than that, because this thing can do arbitrary completion tasks. It doesn't just know how to fill things in left to right. It can fill them in in any order I choose. So here I'm sort of saying, predict this pixel as if it was the next one in the order, given that you've seen these three. Oh, and also predict this one if you had a different order, and this was the next one in the order, given those three things. So I'm training a model to predict any pixel given any context. Or you could think of it as I'm training an enormous ensemble of predictors that can predict an image that I look at the pixels in any order. Yeah, question. Uh, so the question is, uh, as it can predict these multiple pixels, is there an advantage to predicting just one of them and then putting it in and predicting the other one, or could I just predict them both at the same time? And the problem here is that these distributions are independent. So say I'm using a Gaussian for the sake of argument. The multivariate Gaussian over these two pixels is diagonal. I've got no covariance in there in my prediction. Um, so the way I'm going to get dependency in this model is by only predicting one of the features and putting it in, and then when I predict the next one, it will have taken into account the sample I happen to draw. So I'll be draw coherent vectors that way, um, which is something you don't really get in sort of an autoencoder. It just has some simultaneous guess for all of the pixels, but its loss function just cares about the independent pixels. It doesn't care about whether the thing it produced holistically makes sense. Um, so what we've got in this paper is a way of making training fast, but at test time it's still really slow because we're going to have to loop through this neural network many times, one for each pixel. But the training is where we spend most of our time, and you can get the numbers this way. Now we can train this, and we can then, on a small test set, like see how well it's working. And the answer is it does work very well. We finally get better results in mixtures of Gaussians on image patches. Question. So the question is, if the only training mechanism I used was to mask out a single feature and not pick a random number, it would correspond to this old idea in statistics called pseudo-likelihood. And there's some theory about when pseudo-likelihood recovers the correct parameters of a model. Um, and so I think that theory probably doesn't apply here for all sorts of reasons. Um, I mean, this model is not at all identifiable for a start. Um, 
but you might get something sensible, and there are various learning algorithms in machine learning that have that idea. But an observation with this sort of model and also denoising autoencoders is the sort of hidden representation you learn when you do experiments to see what are the representations you're learning. You qualitatively learn quite different hidden representations depending on how much stuff you tend to mask out. So if you mask out almost everything, then it's going to get things that just sort of know about individual pixel statistics and sort of the blurry sort of overall scheme of an image. And if you mask out only individual pixels, it will learn to look very locally around that pixel and fill in and doesn't necessarily learn anything about global coherence. Um, and there have been papers like the scheduled denoising autoencoder that have suggested that you might want to, through training, change this fraction of things you mask out so that you get a diversity of features that you learn. And something that's quite nice about this view that we have is that it tells us, no, you actually need to explore all amounts. You need to learn how to fill in big things and also fill in individual missing pixels. So my feeling is that it might be more useful for feature representation if you don't know what task you have in mind. But for any particular task, it might be that you'll get better features by just using a denoising autoencoder and picking a particular masking level. Um, although I think I might use this loss function that only depends on the missing things, even if I was using a denoising autoencoder. And it's interesting that this very recent paper, BERT, which is a very large-scale transformer model for pre-training language models, has this same trick in it that their features down here are words, they have a sentence, and the task they learn is to miss out some of the words in the sentence and guess what they were. And that's the basis of that, that training method. So it's something that can be useful just for learning features. And they don't bother to do the slightly extra amount of stuff they need to do to turn it into a valid language model because they don't care about the probabilities. Question? Yeah, so that's a good question. If we had a convnet, what do we do with these missing values? Do you set them to zero, minus one, or whatever? So I have a slide on dealing with the missing inputs. So if we had an image, the obvious thing to do is just to set these pixels to zero or an average value. Um, the problem with this completion machine is, as I described it to you, it doesn't really know whether you masked something out or whether it happened to be zero. And so it's a good idea to tell it what you've done so that it knows what prediction problem it's solving. Am I solving the prediction problem given these three inputs where these are masked out? Or am I just predicting this one thing and that one happens to be zero? So a simple way of doing that is to just add a binary mask, a bunch of extra features that are zeros and ones saying which features are real and which ones are masked out and are zero because they're masked out. Um, and if you think of words like training BERT, that would just correspond to having a, an extra row of zeros and ones in your one-hot encoded vector saying these things aren't present. So it would be like having a word that says masked out. Um, and that's all you would do, and it's quite simple. And I think this idea of just having features that says this thing is missing should be used in a lot more statistical models because missing data is prevalent problem in data science. Here the data is missing because I removed it. But often data is missing because of some aspect of the problem. Someone didn't answer that survey question. The device failed at that point. In this part of the data set, that just wasn't gathered or it wasn't turned on. Yeah, OK. So um, so we need to deal with um, missing values in lots of cases. And one way of dealing with that is to do inference about what the missing value was and build probabilistic models. And often those models make strong assumptions about sort of that these things were missing at random. But often the fact that it's missing is data itself. This survey question wasn't answered because the person is embarrassed about the answer the device failed to give an outcome then because you're in some extreme context and that is data, the fact it's missing. So adding in these extra features that says it's missing are sort of a way of, you're not, you're making less strong assumptions and trying to infer what those missing values were. Now the question is, um, what will then the network do with it? So we have some extra inputs, which is some extra binary values that are going to go into this hidden layer. 
and there'll be a weight matrix between the inputs and the hidden values. So parts of that weight matrix are going to be attached to these missing features. So you could think of those weights as shifting the hidden units, and it's a bit like having different biases on this hidden layer depending on which features are missing. And sh shunting around the biases in a hidden layer are just one way of using an input in a neural network, and there are many other ways. So it could be that in a different context, you think you should multiply the output of your hidden units by something. There's a trick called L-hook, um, which is also out of Edinburgh, uh, for adapting models depending on different contexts. So these binary variables, it's up to you how to use them. You can use any neural network trick you like for how am I going to compute stuff in my function depending on some binary variables. And as Zubin was saying in his Ask Me Anything session yesterday, it sort of in some sense, you've got different tasks here. There are different tasks depending on what's masked out, but really different tasks are just you can describe using inputs, and then it's up to you to say how you're going to model that. We just used a standard neural net, so we just put in zeros and ones, and we let the neural net deal with that and cross our fingers. Um, this doesn't work at all, by the way, without this binary mask, or you get absolutely terrible results. OK, so one of the things about this completion machine is that you can choose to complete things in any order. So you could just start at the beginning of the image, and you could raster through it. But you could potentially just, depending on the application, decide which pixel to look at first. So this is a, a toy demo where the red square has masked out some part of the image. And so you can just give the rest of the image to the network and ask for the pixel in the top left corner of that red box. And then you can put that in, and you can ask for the next one. So you can fill in the red box, and you can fill in any fractal red pattern of missing things you like in any order you like. And so here you see the advantage of drawing the pixels one at a time, then all of them together, and that it has correlation. So when you block out this square down here, this number could be a 5 or it could be a 6. And if you didn't have dependencies in these predictions, you'd get some mixture of a 5 and a 6. But instead, it coherently completes either a 5 or a 6, depending on what it does near the beginning. If it starts to close that loop, it will continue to close the loop. If it doesn't start to close it, it will go, oh, oh it must be a 5. I better make it look like a 5. Um, and similarly with the 4 and 9 up here. So. Um, you know, obviously small, noisy demo on uh, MNIST patterns, but we hope that this will happen on larger data sets and the numbers back that up. Question? Um, the question was, if I've masked out a variable and I've got a, a variable that says it's masked out, does the output depend on the input? No, so any masked out variable is set to zero. So a masked out variable becomes a zero where the value would have been, and a one to say that zero isn't a zero, it's a missing value. OK, so we've got something that seems kind of cool. We can answer any question in any order. Um, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, if we had fit a single probabilistic model, like the original NAID, in principle, we could have done this in painting. But it would have actually been an intractable inference problem. I might have had to have run MCMC on the distribution to work out how to complete this thing. Uh, but I would have had a single model. The problem with this model that claims to be able to complete things in different orders is that it isn't actually a single coherent probabilistic model. If I ask what the probability of this digit is by rastering over it in some order, I'll get a different answer to if I rastered over it in the reverse order. So I've actually got a whole bunch of different models, one for every ordering, and they don't exactly agree on what the numbers are. So I thought that that was kind of unfortunate. I was like, is there some way of fixing this 
contradictions, these disagreements between the models. Um, but Benigno was uh, very clever, so Benigno is my PhD student, he was saying, no, this is brilliant, because um, we've trained an exponentially huge ensemble of models for free, for the cost of training one model. We've got an, a huge ensemble of models that disagree, and that's exactly what you want in machine learning, when you want to ensemble things and get better results. So you can get better predictions of an image patch by predicting it in multiple different orders and averaging the probabilities. So we've got this large mixture model. Um, so if you want to spend lots of compute time, uh, test time, uh, you can get much better results by averaging over the ensemble. So we we made everything look wonderful at training time, and then we've said if we're prepared to spend a very, very long time making predictions, we can get very good numbers, but it's all slightly shaky. Okay, so I think at this time this was basically the only model that, at least if you clamped an order, could train deep neural networks and give you valid normalized probabilities that did up, add up to one, and you could take seriously as probabilistic models. But as I said, we had two different tricks, so I'll show you another trick. So uh, this was deep made, and the other trick is called MADE, a masked autoencoder distribution estimator. I forgot what that stood for myself. Um, so what we've got here on the left is a standard autoencoder. We've got some inputs and neural net stuff happens. It's drawn here as a fully connected network, but you could potentially have convolutional layers in there, and we have done that. And then we have a bunch of outputs, as many outputs as pixels. And those in a conventional autoencoder are just numbers that try to be close to those numbers. So the first thing we're going to do is replace that output layer with probability distributions. So we output parameters of a distribution. So if it's real valued, we'll have a mixture of Gaussians again. If it's binary vectors, we just output numbers. We output a number between 0 and 1, giving probabilities. But if we just did that, it would be cheating. The problem with autoencoders is that to predict the third pixel, you follow the arrows back, and you use the third pixel to predict the third pixel. So if you're clever, you just set the connection so that you keep a copy of the third pixel and you get perfect performance. So what we do in the masked autoencoder is we generate some binary masks that we multiply our weight matrices by, which removes some of the links in the neural net. So this is a standard neural net, and we can use the same code as the autoencoder, but a bunch of the weights happen to be zero. And it's not really sparse enough to bother with sparse matrix routines. We just use the matrix as it is, but it has a load of zeros in it. And we've carefully designed the way we construct these masks so that it corresponds to an autoregressive model. So this middle pixel we're going to predict first, and it's not connected at all to the rest of the network. So when we predict that middle pixel, we can't cheat. We just have to say, oh, this is the histogram of what pixels look like and we make our prediction. We then go to the next one in our ordering, that's what this two means, and this pixel is connected to a whole load of hidden units. It's connected to these ones that are labeled one, and it's connected to this one labeled one, and that's only connected to the first pixel that we predicted. So the second pixel we're going to predict is only connected to the one we've already predicted so we're not doing any cheating. And similarly, as you go through all of the pixels and you follow back through the network, it's only connected to things that we've already predicted earlier in the ordering. So it looks like we're predicting things one at a time, except that in our code, we just have a series of matrix multiplies and we compute everything all at once in one pass. So at training time, we have one forward pass and a back prop to get the gradients, and we can then evaluate the probability of this vector all at once. So it's not this separate masked objective. It's actually the likelihood of the model that we can compute. And we can do gradient descent on that likelihood. Um, so that seems quite appealing. Um, at test time, unfortunately, it's still going to be slow. So if I wanted to generate a whole image patch at a time, I can't put the whole image patch in to do all this computation at once because I don't have it yet. I only have the first pixel after I've generated it, and I only have the second pixel after I've generated the first. So I still end up having to sweep through all of my pixels and generate them one at a time. So we've got a pattern here. Again, at training time, things are quick. But at test time, or if we want to sample something, um, 
is not so good. At test time, we can evaluate probabilities quickly. We can just put our image in, and we can evaluate it. But what we can't do is sample things. So this wouldn't be good inside a reinforcement learning system where you want to roll out futures, because it would be really slow. But if you were doing anomaly detection, and you wanted to say what are low probability things, it would be as fast as an autoencoder. Um, I mean, and autoencoders have been used in anomaly detection. I think there was a paper at Neurips in about 1994 on a self-driving car. It was really a self-driving truck that was big enough to carry the computer. And uh, one of the things it did was want to detect when it had driven into a weird situation it didn't know how to deal with, so it would stop. And so it auto-encoded the image of what was in front of the windscreen. And if the reconstruction error was bad, the car would stop. It would go, oh, this is something I haven't seen. And you could imagine doing the same thing with a, a probabilistic model. OK, so we've got these two models. Um, which one should we pick? Unfortunately, as with most things in machine learning, you can find data sets or particular settings, which means that either model tends to win. You usually find that whatever paper came later seems to be better than the previous one, because the student writing the paper had to tweak the model until it got state-of-the-art results so they could publish it. Um, and they didn't necessarily spend as much effort continuing to tweak the previous method. So I know that made and deep made on some problems work better, and there's, there's no ordering. Um, the made models need to be pretty big, and I think that's one of the reasons it took us longer to publish it, as we waited for sort of more GPUs to come in. Um, this masking at every layer, removing the weights, is quite a brutal thing to do to a model, and so you might end up needing pretty big hidden layers so that it can still do something useful. Um, and that makes it sort of quite hard to compare these things. They're like, well, what parameter budget are we going to allow, and exactly what's a fair comparison? Um, both of them can train an ensemble. So as I described it, made is just a model with a likelihood. But these masks in here, we can actually generate randomly, and we can generate different orderings. So we can still choose at training time to randomly pick an ordering and try and learn one set of weights that, when masked out in different ways, will still work. Now it looks a bit like dropout, but it's a different um, principle for doing dropout, and it means at test time you've got some interpretation of what you're doing. You've got this mixture model of different predictors. So summer school, I'm going to just air some dirty laundry and give you a, a tip for writing papers here. It's slightly embarrassing, but we're all friends here, right? You won't tell anyone what an idiot I am, and you know I'm trusting you on the internet not to not to make a big deal of this. So. Um, if you get this paper, the made paper, I like it, it's a, a nice paper, um, the notation is quite heavy. To describe exactly how these masks are generated and how this process works, it's quite a lot of subscripts and superscripts and conventions of which way round our weight matrices are and exactly how this masking will work. And so, you know, we have a pseudocode box that says this is how this mechanism works to sort of completely define it. And there are also quite a few equations in the paper that, you know, we hope are compatible with the pseudocode box. And in the NAID paper, we'd been burnt by this because the pseudocode box in the NAID paper <coughs> is wrong. So the, the, the algorithm to anyone who knows about machine learning looks fairly obvious, and you glance over it quickly, and there's no problem, and no reviewer spotted a problem, and we didn't see a problem reading it many times. But what inevitably happens is six months later, when someone is, some grad student is told to implement it, and they go through the pseudocode box very carefully, they find it doesn't make any sense, and they send you an email saying, what on earth is going on? So when we were writing this paper, I felt that the probability of our notation being correct was probably 10 to the minus 3. And and I didn't want this to happen again, because it was hugely embarrassing and a massive pain to try and issue corrections for the previous paper. So we had an implementation of this thing, and we were publishing that implementation. But I forget which toolkit it was in. It was probably in Theano. You know, not everyone is going to just run our code. People are going to want to re-implement it. At least we hope so, right? So this, this pseudocode box has to be correct. Um, so what I did was um, I, I didn't write the code for this paper, but I took the pseudocode box and I just implemented it line by line in MATLAB. And then I could write some unit tests. So I could check, is this node connected to anything it shouldn't be? Is this node connected to anything it should be? And I did all of that. And of course, it was littered with mistakes. There were zillions of matrices the wrong way around. There were all sorts of um, subscripts that went right. And these mistakes cascaded because I fixed things. And then other things went consistent with that. So I'm pretty sure that 
this is a bit of a dangerous thing to say, I'm pretty sure that this paper is actually correct, that the pseudocode box is right and the equations are right. Um, but I'm only sure of that because we actually unit tested the pseudocode, and I think it's pretty rare to do that. So um, it's a bit painful, but something that is worth doing. And no one sent us a correction yet, and this has more citations in the other paper, so hopefully it's okay. Okay. So um, if we were actually modeling things like an audio sequence or images, these things I've described to you with dense neural net connections aren't going to be state of the art. Like the way to get state of the art results on images is actually to use convolutional neural networks. And there are models, we, I mean, we've put convolutional neural nets into MADE, but you know, there's much better work out of DeepMind on uh, pixel RNNs and pixel CNNs that give uh, images that look a lot better than what you generate from these models, and they give um, audio that sounds much better. So, um, WaveNet has a similar idea of masking. You can put in a whole image, uh, sorry, a whole audio sequence, and it can evaluate the whole thing at once because it has a bunch of masking through its convolutions so it can't cheat. And it has exactly, the original WaveNet has exactly the same problem as made for the same reason. At training time, you can say, this is the probability of the sequence, but then when you predict the audio, you have to do it one item at a time, and it's dog slow. They refused to tell you how long it would take in their first press release because it was so embarrassing how slow it was to, to generate the audio, um, which is something they fixed and I can return to. Um, what's interesting is that the probability densities attached to these images and audio aren't necessarily that much better from these confnets and these uh, sequence models than from the generic models. So in, not in this older work, but in recent work, we can model image patches and get similar numbers to pixel CNNs. And then we generate images, and they look awful. Um, and the densities are similar. So there's a lot of biases about things that look good that have been baked into these architectures sort of through their development. And we've learned that they're good sort of feature detectors. But we should be a bit suspicious when we move to generic feature vectors that don't have the same structure in them, that these neural nets are really going to sort of perform well, because we don't have generic tools that perform as well on images as special tools. And so maybe for other data, like a vector of galaxy features, we could do better. We just don't know how yet. OK, so um, I promised you that there would be three different chunks of density estimation methods. So that concludes, for the moment, what I've got to say about these autoregressive models, that the sort of NADE versions were the simplest versions, and now there are these very large, sophisticated versions that sort of generate audio that sounds better than any speech synthesis or audio generation system that came before. Um, what are some other principles? So this middle section I put in for historical interest partly. So I'm not, you'll, you might wonder why I'm going to talk about it, because I'm not going to seriously suggest you should use any of these methods. But there's um, tricks and things in there that might come around again and might be useful. And it's sort of good to know what's out there. So the idea of an unnormalized model is, I, I'm really keen on attaching a number to a feature, right? I've got an image patch, and I want to say, what's P of X? What's the probability of that image patch? So if I'm producing a number, why don't I just represent that number with a function? So we could do that. So here is a model that has a machine learning technology that just outputs a number. I'm going to have a function drawn from a Gaussian process. And the standard Gaussian process, as you all know now, takes in whatever features you want to, whatever you can put kernels on, and it returns a number. So could we get that number to represent our probability density and be done somehow? Um, so we can if we work hard enough. It just turns out to be really painful. So the first thing we need to do is say that number is positive or negative from a Gaussian process. And the last time I looked, probability densities were positive. So let's do something to make it positive. So here's my Gaussian process function. I'm going to put a nonlinearity around it to make it positive. And then what is that nonlinearity? So in the statistics literature, that would traditionally just be the exponential function, make it positive. And then you'd have unbounded densities, and densities can be, can be unbounded. You can have very large densities. And for technical reasons to make our algorithms and proofs go through, we needed that function to be bounded. So in our particular work, we used a sigmoid function. Um, 
But in general, like in many neural network architectures, you face this issue of I've got some number and I need it to be in a sensible range, what should it be? So you want to have in your back pocket what are the things I drop in here. And in, in my practical work, I always used to exponentiate numbers, and now I almost always apply a soft plus to them, so log of 1 plus e to the x, a soft hinge, um, because I found that putting exponentials inside neural networks seems to be just asking to for the numerics to blow up and for me to get nans at the end. So I have this knee-jerk reaction now of when I make things positive, I try and leave the large values alone and only make the negative values small. Okay, so here we're doing density estimation. So we need, we've got our positive values. We also need uh, the integral over all values to be bounded because this distribution has to add up to one. And we ensure that happens by multiplying by some distribution like a Gaussian that just forces it down to zero outside some range. And then it needs to be normalized. And we wrote a whole paper on how to deal with the fact that we can't evaluate that integral. So we have an algorithm that in a valid way using Monte Carlo methods can explore this model without ever evaluating that integral. And then you can fit pretty funky densities. So with Gaussian processes, you can model all sorts of interesting functions. So you can model functions that are small, that don't saturate this nonlinearity, and you just get slightly blobby functions. You can get Gaussian processes that threshold this thing, and so you get cliffs in your density. You can decide whether your Gaussian process should very quickly or only very quickly in some direction, because the Gaussian process has hyperparameters. If you wanted periodic densities, you could do that too. So any Gaussian process tricks you could use. Um, but good luck applying this to large data sets. So I think this is useful in small statistical models, and I've used it in some statistical analyses, but I have no idea how I'd apply this to a million data points in a thousand dimensions. So. Uh, all of this issue of how to normalize these things is tricky. So another density estimator that falls into this setting of an unnormalized model where we just assign a positive probability to how good things are are restricted Boltzmann machines, which were super trendy about 10 years ago and rapidly fell out of favor again. Um, but they've got a special place in my heart because they were sort of what brought me into neural networks when I'd just been doing statistics. And this was sort of one of the first experiments I did to prove to myself that they actually do something interesting. So um, on the left, I've got actual data, so very pixelated values of these hundred and digits. In the middle, I've got samples from a mixture model. So I said that it's very hard to model binary data with a mixture model because it's hard to model the dependencies. And on the right, I've got what this restricted Boltzmann machine does with actually basically the same number of parameters as this model. So it's not just that I'm being a matching machine learning person and throwing lots of parameters at it. It's actually got a better structure. It's using the parameters better. Um, and it assigns much higher probabilities to these digits. So by any model comparison metric on held out data, this model is just basically infinitely better than the other model. Um, but that number, there's a little asterisk, which means not really. Um, it's hard to evaluate the probabilities in these models. So this is, uh, for those of you here who entered machine learning after 2009, this is what a restricted Boltzmann machine is. Um, you put your pixels into one layer of units. There are undirected connections, so there are no arrows here, to another layer of hidden units that are unobserved. And it defines a distribution over your pixels and your hidden values according to some positive function we can evaluate, and we normalize it to make it a distribution. So it's a hidden variable model, which I said I wanted to avoid. And it's got this thing we can't compute, which I wanted to avoid. And this bipartite structure in this graph means we can actually sum out all the latent variables in this model quite easily. So we can do this sum over this exponentially huge number of settings of hiddens analytically and say that the probability of an image patch, given the parameters, all of these weights, is something we can evaluate. And then there's this one constant, this one normalizing constant we don't know. Um, and it's that one constant I had to estimate. So uh, there's an approximation here. Um, you can use nested sampling, and I have done to evaluate this number. And you can also use um, annealing methods and various other methods. OK, so why is this number such a big deal? I've got this z here, and in the Gaussian process model, I had this z. I think it's just worth understanding what that means, and it is relevant to various other bits of machine learning. So we're modeling a green positive function. 
the exponential of a Gaussian process, or this undirected graphical model that says how compatible the variables are. And our parameters control the shape of that green function. So when we're learning, we will move those parameters to some other setting of the parameters and change the function. And what I've got on the right is another positive function that assigns higher values to the data. So imagine here these blue ticks in my data than they did before. So this change in parameters has attached a higher positive function to my data, which looks good. But this change also created this bubble in data space where there's some other region that has also been given high probability. And what this normalizing constant does is penalizes that bu bubble and says this model is actually worse. If you were to generate samples from it, you'd get loads of stuff over here really far from your data. So if we don't have a normalized model and we don't estimate that normalizing constant, we have to do something else so that we don't just learn a function that has bigger and bigger values on our data, but also bigger values everywhere else. And this problem is sort of uh, spread across many different areas of statistics and machine learning. And there are a lot of algorithms that relate to this issue. So to fit RBMs, you need to be able to detect these bubbles and penalize them and do something about it. And one way to do that is to draw samples from the model and see that you've got things far from the data and have a learning signal from that. Another thing you can do is just draw samples across the data space in any way you like and then look at those values. And again, you might detect bubbles. Um, and so there's a whole bunch of methods that use so-called negative examples. So contrastive divergence, stochastic approximation, algorithms that sample from the model or use Markov chains to approximately sample from the model and notice when synthetic samples are given very high scores. You only want to give high scores to your data. Um, there's another method called noise contrastive estimation, which is also been considered for training very large language models where there's a similar normalization issue in, in large language models. The core idea of GANs, I think, is in this noise contrastive estimation paper. Whenever I saw um, people give talks on this, there was a common question of like, oh, you're generating this noise from this distribution, couldn't you adapt that? And it was like, you know, the, the seeds of this idea are right there. As soon as you adapt a few things in this algorithm, you have a GAN. Um, but you could do anything else you like. So you could use variational inference, which you learned about last week, to approximate this normalizing constant. And in fact, um, that's exactly where NAID came from. So I described to you this algorithm, and I just said, here is a procedure, and it kind of makes sense, and it's very simple. Um, but the way to publish the paper is to do something that looks really complicated. So the really complicated thing we did was we took this model and we applied variational inference to it, which is a terrible idea. It works really badly. Um, and so what predictions would we make if we applied variational inference to this model? And then we took the form of those predictions and said, that's the thing we're going to fit. We're going to fit that predictor. And out of that drops NAID. So out of it drops something very simple, but it's this nice connection between the models. You could inflict the pain of this latent variable model with this intractable constant, but if you're just doing generic modeling and you don't care about those latent variables, then just do something hacky to inspire something that's simpler and then fit the simpler thing. So that was uh, what we learned there. And there is, if you look around the literature, you can see all sorts of places where people derive approximations to models and then say, well, what we're going to do is just fit this approximation directly rather than sort of treat this approximation seriously, which might get us into trouble. Okay. Um, Jan LeCun is one of these people who doesn't believe in probabilities. So he likes this view of attaching positive functions to data, but has other ways of crushing these bubbles that don't involve explicitly talking about probabilities. And you know, I think it's good to keep a diverse set of views. So this machine learning summer school is very probabilistic heavy. Um, go read what other people have to say as well and you know, make up your own mind about these things. OK, so um, so far, the autoregressive models seem to be winning because these unnormalized models have something completely intractable in them. But the autoregressive models are pretty expensive, and we want to have something that might be neater. So this third idea, which has had a lot of recent attention, um, I now just call flows. They're originally called normalizing flows or probabilistic normalizing flows, but I think good ideas deserve short names. So. The core of the idea is that 
we're going to transform noise. So just like a GAN does, um, we're going to draw some random numbers from some simple distribution. We may as well pick a Gaussian. And then we're going to apply some function to that noise, and that's going to be our model of our data. So it's sort of a latent variable model. We've got some latent variables, but they depend in a deterministic way on uh, our data depends on those variables in a deterministic way. And models of the, the form I said so far go way, way back. David Mackay had something called density networks in the mid-90s, which is the reason we have to call mixture density networks mixture density networks, even if they only have one component and aren't a mixture, because they're a completely different thing to these density networks. It's annoying, but that's where we are. So that's an idea, and it would be very easy to draw samples from this model. So I could invent any neural network I like here, draw some noise, and look at what happens. But then there's a question of how do we fit it. And it might be that various different noise patterns lead to the same output. And then that would be hard to reason about. When you see data, you wouldn't know which noise had generated it. You'd have an inference problem. Um, and we also want to be able to evaluate tractably the probability under this thing. So normalizing flows add additional constraints so that with this idea, we'll be able to evaluate probabilities, unlike in GANs, where we have to use some other mechanism to tie down what this function is. So um, as it's a summer school, I'll just remind you how some probability works. Um, so here's a reminder about the fact that probability densities and probabilities are not quite the same thing, and we have to be slightly careful about that. So um, I tend to use capital P for probabilities, the probability that some outcome lies between a range A and B relates to the density according to an integral. So this number could be bigger than one, and is a bit weird, and this is a relationship between densities and probabilities. And this integral uh, simplifies if we assume that A and B are very close together. So if we're saying, what's the probability of landing in some very thin range around x, so x plus delta over 2, x minus delta over 2, then we just say it's the density multiplied by bin width. So we can grid up our distribution really finely. Okay. So the densities and probabilities behave totally differently when we transform them. It's one of the biggest differences between densities and probabilities. If I've got a discrete distribution, so I can either be 1, 2, or 3, and these bars just give normal probabilities, then what happens if I transform the distribution? So I'm going to create a new thing, z, which is 2 times x. Well, these bars just move along, and they stay the same height, but they're planted in different places. And the probability of being at z equals 4 is the same as the probability of x being at 2, because it's the same bar that I've just moved. Whereas densities don't do that. So here I've got a density over x. I transform x. I say the same thing. z is 2 times x. That density spreads out. And the area under that density has to remain 1, so it has to go down by a factor of 2. So now when I look at the red bars that look at corresponding points that correspond to the same value, the densities are different. So I have to correct densities. And in general, when I uh, stretch out a variable, um, I might stretch in some places more than others. So I have to look at the stretching factor and work out what it is. So I've got a slide of maths of how that works. Here's the answer. Um, for a, a flow, which is an invertible function, we're going to say, we're going to create our data using an invertible function of our noise so that given our data, we could just invert that function and work out what noise generated it. This Jacobian matrix, which is just a bunch of partial derivatives that software can work out for us, is how we correct the probabilities. So here, to attach a probability to an image patch, we work out what numbers would create that image patch. And there is only one vector, because we've got an, an invertible function. We work out the probability of drawing that noise, and then we take into account the complicated stretching that the neural network does. So to get a flow, we can use a large family of neural networks, but they better be invertible. And we also have to be able to compute that Jacobian, which we can usually do. That's not the hard bit. So um, something that will look different to other neural networks is that we're going to have to have the same number of hiddens at every layer. So if we've got 1,000 pixels, we'll have 1,000 hiddens at every layer and 1,000 outputs, because there's no way we're going to have an invertible transformation if we've got a weight matrix that's rectangular. Right? Only square matrices have inverses. Um, and 
that might be a slightly limiting constraint. Often I have rectangular weight matrices, um, although Intel like optimize their square matrix operations more than their rectangular ones, so maybe it's a good bias to have towards the square ones. Um, so there's been a, a series of papers that come up with different creative ways of making flows, and one of the first really compelling ones for image patches was this one called Real NVP. NVP stands for non-volume preserving transformation. So this Jacobian has squashes in it. We get our random space and we squish it together. Um, images lie on some thin, skinny manifold in a high-dimensional space. They're not a big ball that we started with. So, uh, Real NVP has a bunch of careful choices of the layers so that um, nothing collapses and it tends to work. And it uh, had a good version of batch norm when, back when batch norm was a fairly recent trick that I think one of the things it's doing is helping make sure this thing is invertible every layer, that none of the nonlinearities saturate and really squash things down. And what's amazing about this model that kind of shocked me was that in one pass I can evaluate a density, but it's not autoregressive, it's just this transformation. They can also sample in one pass, so they can do both of these things really quickly. They train one model and it does both of these jobs. So GANs can sample, but they don't give you densities. MADE can give you densities, but it's not intractable, but dog slow to sample. This thing does both and it looked pretty good. So it's a um, pretty cool idea. It only applies to real valued quantities. So this whole flow idea is about transforming real values into real values. If we're doing MADE, we can have Poisson outputs, we can have discrete outputs, we can model all sorts of different feature types and it's flexible and each output can come from a different distribution. Um, but lots of data is just a bunch of real valued numbers and so flows are a nice fit. Okay, so here are the gratuitous pretty pictures. One of the recent flows that really follows on from real NVP um, is Glow from OpenAI, and they've got a very flashy blog post where you can zoom in and see very high resolution pictures. It's probably not quite as good as the biggest, biggest GAN pictures, but you know, it shows that we're not necessarily severely restricting ourselves by saying we want models that give valid probabilities. You can model very complicated data sets. Okay, um, it's always good to leave a tutorial knowing less. So um, it's terrible if you've got lots and lots of ideas and then you're like, which on earth of these am I going to use? So let's try and collapse some of these ideas and see if they're actually the same thing. So um, King Maratel, I'll give credit in a minute to them, had this neat observation that actually made, the thing I told you about first, is a flow when it's modeling real valued data. So made, which was this thing, looked like an autoencoder, and I didn't put in the bottom here noise, I put in the actual image, right? So how on earth is this a flow? I'm doing something totally different. Um, and I, I was sort of, ah. Okay, this might take a while. I was kind of um, shocked when I read this, and I was like, okay, this is obvious in hindsight, but I just didn't realize it. So what they say is that after you do this pass and you're going to generate things, you sample from a bunch of distributions at the top. So the, the neural network gives you a bunch of means and variances and then you sample the pixels using Gaussians with those means and variances. And so what does the code look like? The code looks like you take your input, you apply some complicated function to it which gives you a bunch of means and variances. You then draw some random numbers from a spherical Gaussian, and then you shift and scale those standard normal numbers to get samples from the Gaussians that you wanted to. So to sample one of the pixels, you say, what's the mean according to made? What's the standard deviation according to made, which depend on the previous pixels? And then you transform the standard normal using that shift and scale, and that's how a Gaussian number generator works. You write code for the standard normal and then you shift and scale it. So the function doesn't look like you'd normally imagine where the noise goes in at the bottom and stuff happens. Most of the effort is going into working out what the shift and scale is, but it is a function of these random variables. And um, the function does depend on x, but in this autoregressive way on the previous thing, so it's not cheating. So you do get an invertible function where once you've generated an x, 
you can put it back in and work out what all the shifts and scales were, and you can work out what random numbers must have generated it. So uh, this thing implicitly defines a reversible mapping between random numbers and images, and you can work out explicitly what that is. So I started out being like, oh, I don't want to do latent variable modeling. I want to do something simple and direct. But actually, by mistake, I did some latent variable modeling because made is a latent variable model where I can work out what my latent variables corresponding to my data were. So um, someone else in my uh, group, George Pampermacorius, had the insight that, oh, something we do in statistics when we've got latent variables is we do model checking and we check, does this model make sense and do the latent variables make sense? So this is a figure of an example of how you can use this insight to critique the, the model and work out what you might be doing wrong. So here is a toy problem with this a contours of a target density, it's a weird density. And we fit it with a, just a one layer made model where we predict the x axis first and then the y axis. So if you predict that you've got to be in this column somewhere, we've got a bimodal conditional distribution. And if we had a large mixture, we would just put a Gaussian here and a Gaussian here, and we'd output the parameters of a bimodal distribution. But we have only given the output layer a single Gaussian. So we've got a mixture density network with one component. And so what it has to do is cover both modes and predict here. So this is the density that a one layer made with single Gaussians predicts when we've picked the ordering badly. And what you can do with this model is for all of your training points, you can say, what were the random numbers corresponding to these training points? And you can plot them. And that's what the scatter plot is. And those points, according to our model, came from a spherical Gaussian. And it doesn't look spherical. So we know something's gone wrong. So what we can do is we can say, does it look like we've got a consistent fit? If not, we've got some middle mismatch, and we've got something that we need to fix. And this is something we can fix. One of the nice things about flows is that they're composable. So if you've got an invertible function, and you apply another invertible function to the output and put them together, end to end, you've got an invertible function, and you know the Jacobian. So you can take this one layer made model, interpret it as a flow, and then stack them together. So in this figure, we've got what's called a masked autoregressive flow. It's a flow which is created by taking a made model, so a model that we didn't think of as a flow, converting it into a flow and composing them. And if you stick five layers together, then you pass this model checking criterion and you get points that look like they come from a Gaussian. So um, we now have what we usually like in deep learning, which is composable layers. And we can choose how many of them to stack together. And we get more and more complicated models as we do it. And the main reason I'm really excited about this is that large mixtures of Gaussians really suck to fit. So a bunch of you at the summer school have come up to me and said, I've tried to fit mixture density networks. And I'm like, yeah, I know. It's a complete pain. And you get NANs, and it's very difficult to initialize. And by the way, if anyone wants to fit mixture density networks, my students have been through this pain and have some quite good implementations. So send me an email. Um, but if you only have a single Gaussian output, it's easier to deal with. And these large mixtures are expensive. So now, rather than deciding how deep is our net and how many um, components do we have, we can just make this one choice. We're always going to use one Gaussian, and we're going to just go deep. So um, what do I want to cover? There are some other flows, but I think I will. Um, I want to move on. So. The main take home message from this thing is that we now have the ability to use all of the sort of modern machine learning tricks. There's no reason that we couldn't put transformers in these things. We could put, I'm not sure I've seen that done in a paper, but we, you could write a paper on that. Um, we, you can put convolutional layers in these things, and we can have direct probabilistic models of very large objects. So we can do density estimation on audio and images, and I'm more excited about doing um, density estimation on other things. And we haven't necessarily lost an awful lot. We can make it look like autoencoders. Um, it's not that much harder than other neural nets. Um, there are some constraints. So I, what I've written here is if all you're doing is pre-training some features, doing something that formally gives you a valid probability might 
be overkill. And if you relax the constraints slightly, you might get better features. So instead of if masking out both almost everything and only single pixels, you choose a masking level. For your problem, you might get better features. Um, but if you wanted to be able to generate images, you could do that too with small tweaks to your code. OK. I am nearly done. I think something I'll end with is something just because it um, relates to a, a sort of a bunch of deep learning things. And I, I won't, as there's only a few minutes left, I, I won't go into a new topic. Um, a lot of us, when we fit large models, reach the problem that it's like, this is going to be a pain to deploy. This is very slow at test time. And maybe if we're doing something like MADE, it's very slow at test time, because um, we still haven't learned how to make MADE fast at test time. Um, there's an old literature on how to make large, unwieldy machine learning systems uh, easier to deal with. So um, in the machine learning summer school franchise, there's a lot of emphasis on the sort of machine learning end of the community, the people who go to ICML and Europe's. But there's also sort of the data mining end of the community that sort of publish in KDD, which is a good meeting. So this was a paper from KDD over 10 years ago, pointing out that when people win prediction competitions, they often ensemble together lots of models. I've been ensembling models together. Um, and those things win the prediction competition, but you'd never want to deploy them. And what they did in this paper in 2006 was train the large ensemble anyway, um, because they had a lot of time offline to do that, and then fit that ensemble, fit the predictions that ensemble made with a single model that they would be prepared to deploy. So there's, you're going to fit something like a small neural network at the end, and you'll deploy that. And you might ask, why didn't you just fit that small neural network in the first place? Why didn't you just throw your data at that, rather than doing this weird thing of creating an ensemble of hundreds of things and then distilling it? Um, and the most compelling answer is, well, empirically, this works better. Um, it's, you know, that's not a satisfying answer, but it's the real answer. Um, but there are all sorts of stories about how um, the ensembling procedures do something that we don't know how to do in our training. Um, this averaging procedure gives you sort of um, robust predictions that don't overfit to the noise. And then you've got a much cleaner training signal to train your neural network, because rather than noisy data examples, you've got, for a classification problem, probabilities that you can match. And it's an easier fitting problem. But I'm not sure I completely understand how it works, but it, it does work. Um, for uh, theoretical reasons, this distilling can be good to do, even if you don't actually want to do it. So there was a big debate in the literature about whether deep neural networks were actually necessary. And this uh, compression has been used to say, yeah, you can. We all know we can fit arbitrary functions with shallow neural networks. We just don't know how to fit data with them. So you can try and copy what deep neural networks do with shallow neural networks. And there are some caveats to that statement. In the context of what I've been talking about, probabilistic models, there are particular tricks you can do. So um, George Papamakura has wrote a 100-page master's dissertation on this subject. I've got a restricted Boltzmann machine that's really expensive and intractable. And I've got a NADE, which is cheap, but maybe I can train the RBM better. So I'll train the RBM first, and then I'll work out how to copy it. And I'll work out how to copy it, even though the RBM is intractable. Or I've got a Bayesian prediction uh, system. I've sampled lots and lots of samples using MCMC. I want something compact that I can deploy that I don't have to carry all these samples around. So there are special things with probabilistic models that make this distilling setup more interesting. But it's basically all been worked out. And another version of that is this Bayesian dark knowledge paper. Um, and that is an idea which has been used in production. So when Google say they use WaveNet now, they use parallel WaveNet. They fit the thing that I told you about, which is quick at training time, but completely impractical at test time. You cannot sample from it um, in the highest quality that they want uh, using reasonable compute. Um, but then they get a flow that you can sample from quickly, and they mimic what the WaveNet did with the flow, and then they deploy the fast thing. And you may very well ask, would it have been possible to fit 
the flow directly, and you know maybe it is because there's now wave glow, which is a flow which gets amazing audio results. Um, but this thing worked too. So one of the lessons that you can learn from this is work out whether it's possible to solve the problem at all, not constraining yourself to think, oh, everything has to work out, everything has to be quick at every stage, but work out what's possible first. And then this is some last resort way, this model distillation of sort of making it practical. And we all hope that in the end we'll have a more direct way of doing it because training multiple things in a row is a bit of a pain. So I think I should wrap up. Uh, um, I've uh, got this um, wider picture that most of you should start with classification, but density estimation is not that much harder than autoencoding, so I hope it's something that you'll try, and it's fun to look at when you can sort of sample futures. Um, I think for a lot of business cases, being able to sample future examples of what might happen is useful for forecasting. Um, if you do happen to have real values, then I'd go with flows because they're convenient and fast, but if you've got a whole mix of weird features, um, then autoregression is fine. If you know how to predict each of your features individually, then you can put each of those models on the top of a neural net and model a whole lot jointly, and you've got a joint model. So that's the main message. Thanks very much.